Okay, guys, this is the male reproductive uh, system disorders that I could not find when we were doing the study group. I found it, and that's why we were starting on slide 11, because the first 10 slides was the short renal review that we did in study group. So I'm going on to the next slide, which is the male reproductive system. As you can see, the male reproductive system has the scrotum and testes. And the prostate, which is right here. And if you'll notice that the urinary bladder is here and the urethra goes right in the middle of that prostate. You also have your ejaculation duct right here, which also goes in the middle of your prostate. And let's see, and then your, re your urethra goes all the way down. Okay. The biggest problems with male reproductive system is benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, prostate cancer, prostatitis, problems with the penis, scrotum, testes, and erectile dysfunction. The male reproduction dysfunction may affect reproduction, it may affect sexuality, and it may affect urinary elimination. Of course, the patient is going to be experiencing anxiety and probably embarrassment. So when you discuss this with your male patients, again, you're going to be very matter of fact. Again, you're going to have to think about their cultural differences uh, and any emotional issues. And obviously a need for privacy will enhance open communication. So you don't wanna be getting into a detailed uh, uh, information without privacy. Now, what's the purpose of the prostate gland? Now, we all know we have a prostate gland, but, or not we, men, but why do we have it? Why, does, why do they have it? Well, number one, it's part of the male reproductive system. It produces and stores a fluid along with the sperm cells from the testes. So the sperm cells are created from the testes, and then they are sent to the prostate to be stored. And then there's another fluid that comes from the vulvar urethra gland. And along with these fluids, these two fluids and the sperm cells, this creates the semen, okay? Semen contains an enzyme called PSA. You're gonna hear about PSA a lot, that PSA is very important. So be sure you understand about PSA. And this enzyme ensures that sperm motility and health and fertility. All these fluids and sperm cells mixed and is forced out during the ejaculation, okay? Now, usually uh, there is a sphincter in the bladder that closes during ejaculation, so it prevents these sperm cells from going back into the bladder in most cases in a healthy adult, but you can have retrograde ejaculation, and we'll talk about that more in detail in a little bit. So let's talk about benign prostate hyperplasia. Very, very common in men. Uh, the older they get, the more likely they're gonna have it. Um, now, a lot of the people who get, or a lot of men who get it in their 40s, 20% will have it in the 40s, and most of those will be African-American men. And why, we don't know, but they have a higher incidence early in life. But look at that, when you reach your 70s and 80s, 80 to 90% of men have uh, an enlarged prostate. The etiology of the enlargement is really not completely understood. Uh, recent studies do show chronic inflammation may play a role. And other contributing factors are hormonal changes associated with aging as we age our hormones don't act like they do when we are younger. Obesity, especially abdominal obesity, lack of exercise, if uh, they have alcohol, smoking, of course, diabetes, uh, erectile dysfunction, 
and if they have a first degree relative with it, they're more likely to have it. The hormone changes, there is a dihydrate testosterone, which is DHT, and that's the sex hormone that stimulates prostate cell growth. Males secrete testosterone and small amounts of estrogen in a normal working prostate. As males age, testosterone secretion decreases. Now their estrogen doesn't increase, but the proportion changes because it continues to excrete the estrogen at the normal rate, but it doesn't excrete the same amount of testosterone. And that is what that's what stimulates the DHT to be released. And that's when you get the benign prostatic hypertrophy. So basically the cause of it is because they don't have the same amount of testosterone circulating as when they get, or as when they're younger. Now DHT secretion increases causing increased growth of the prostate and it's usually the inner prostate. Now, prostate cancer is usually on the outer part of the prostate, and the benign hyperplasia is usually on the inside, and that's what constricts the urethra because it's on the inside, and that's where the urethra is. The overgrowth can extend up into the neck of the bladder, which causes even more symptoms, but mainly their symptoms are from the compression of the urethra. And there is no relationship between the prostate size and the severity of the symptoms. It all depends on where the urethra is being compressed and the degree of compression. So let's say a man could have a very, very large prostate, but because of where the enlargement is, it's not really uh, obstructing the urethra, then they're not going to have a whole lot of symptoms. But it could also be someone who has just a little bit of overgrowth, a little bit of enlargement, but because of where it's at and the degree of obstruction, then they have a huge amount of symptoms. So it, it's not related to how big the prostate is. It's related to where it is and the degree of obstruction. In other words, location, location, location. Again, the clinical manifestation uh, manifestations are you have the irritative symptoms because your bladder is irritated because the urine is sitting there. So that would be nocturia and that's oftentimes the very first symptom. Uh, your frequency but not feeling like you're emptying, urgency, dysuria, bladder pain and incontinence. And those are usually like an overflow, dribbling incontinence. And then the obstructive symptoms are a decreased volume of urine, a decreased force in your urine stream, and difficulty you're initiating a urine stream. They're sitting there, standing there for a long time, and they just can't get the urine stream going, but they feel like they really need to go. Uh, intermittency. Uh, they'll go, and it will stop, and it will go, and it will stop, and they have to stand there forever before they feel like their bladder is emptying. And then they have the dribbling afterwards. Complications are usually rare, but they can occur. And one of the biggest ones is the urinary retention, UTIs, and it can be pyelonephritis and bladder stones because the residual urine becomes alkalotic just sitting in the bladder. So the more alkalotic it is, because you know urine is supposed to be acidotic, but as it sits there, it becomes alkalotic and then bladder stones are more prevalent now, kidney stones are not more prevalent, but bladder stones are. And then if you have enough of this urinary retention, you can back up the urine into the ureters and then into the pelvis of the kidney, which causes hydronephrosis, and that's the backup of the urine, and that can lead to kidney failure. Okay, here's one of the questions that we didn't quite get to uh, today, so we're going to do it now. The symptoms of BHP can mimic the symptoms of, pause me because I'm going to give you the answer. Uh, so think about it. 
And the answer is UTI, okay, because that's the symptoms. Okay, diagnosis uh, is from your HMP, and there is a index, a tool that we use from the American Urological Association. Now, this is more uh, urologists use this tool, uh, and, but it's very widely used to determine how severe it is, and you have this tool in your book, so you might just want to read over it. Another thing that we do is the digital rectal exam. The DRE. In benign prosthetic hyper, uh, hyperplasia, the prostate is usually even, it's symmetrical, it is enlarged, and it's firm and smooth. Now, the way you differentiate that is prostate cancer is asymm uh, asymmetrical, it's modular, and it's hard, not firm. A normal prostate sort of feels elastic. So it shouldn't feel firm or hard. And, but that is one of the characteristics that can help you differentiate between the benign process and the cancer, although that's not definitive. Okay, of course, we're going to get a urinalysis. And then we're going to do the PSA. Remember I told you we would be hearing this again? Prostate-specific antigen. This is specifically for prostate cancer. But it can also be slightly elevated in the benign prosthetic hyper, uh, hyperplasia. So it, what they look for is trends. Okay, The normal range depends on the age. And normally it will increase with age because your prostate is growing. So you might have a slightly elevated PSA and not have cancer. Okay, So Harvard University puts out a list by age, and the range is 0 to 6.5. I'm not going to ask you that, but know that, you know, it's a range, and they're looking for a trend um, to help. And then you want to check the serum creatinine, and we're going to check the serum creatinine so that we can rule out neurogenic bladder. It's not going to give us the diagnosis of benign prostate hyperplasia, but it can rule out neurogenic bladder, so we get one step closer to an accurate diagnosis. Uh, one of the things they will do is a transrectal ultrasound. Now, this is usually ordered if the PSA is elevated and if the digital rectal exam is abnormal findings. So this will help differentiate if it's BPH or prostate cancer. And during this ultrasound, we can take biopsies. And the biopsies will be the definitive diagnosis, OK? But it also helps provide an accurate assessment of the size. Another diagnostic test we can do is a urinal flow meter. And basically, what it does is measures the volume of urine expelled from the bladder. This also helps determine the extent of urethral blockages. Remember that AUA uh, assessment tool? This is part of it. And then they might do a cystoscopy to uh, directly visualize if it's unclear or a visual assessment is needed for some reason. But the definitive uh, diagnosis is biopsy. The goals of treatment is to restore bladder drainage, to relieve the client's symptoms, and to prevent or treat complications. Uh, we are not going to be able to fix it. So we need to, uh, well, I, I take that back. We can help it or we can do surgery. So we can fix it, but it's not always needed to do surgery. Because if we can do these goals, if we can achieve these goals without surgery, yay. So some conservative treatment for this is active surveillance, which means we watch and see. Okay, uh, We might do some dietary changes. We're going to decrease our caffeine, artificial sweeteners, and spicy foods. And that's because those are all irritating to the bladder. And we already have irritative symptoms, remember? So let's decrease the irritation to our bladder. Anticholinergics can also irritate the bladder. 
So we're going to try and decrease that. We are going to try avoiding schedule, just like with the bladder incontinence. We're going to try avoiding schedule to see if that will help. We're going to try and decrease fluid restriction in the evening. Remember, we have nocturia, so they're not going to get any rest. So we're going to do a fluid restriction in the evening to decrease the episodes of them getting up and going to the bathroom. And if the worse, if the symptoms worsen, then this active surveillance is done. Uh, it's time to act further. So uh, the worsening of symptoms means that now we need to take it a little bit further. And the next step we do is medications. And there are two major classes of drugs that are used. Usually a combination to, it, it is used to increase effectiveness. And you have your 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and these reduce the size of the prostate. It blocks the enzyme which is needed to convert the testosterone into DHT. And again, remember that the prostate size is directly to, related to the amount of DHT. So if you have a decrease testosterone and, and you have a higher level of estrogen than what is normal because the proportions are wrong, then you're going to have overgrowth. Uh, and we usually give these uh, used for moderate to severe symptoms. Now, Proscar or Finasteride is one of the most common ones. And it, but it can take up to six months for improvement. Now, this decreases BSA level by 50%. So what happens is when you do the PSA levels after six months, you're seeing a 50% decrease. So in order to get an accurate trend, you need to double the PSA reading. Because remember, this is decreasing it. So we don't want it to mask cancer. So if it's decreasing PSA by 50%, say it's a 10. Okay. So seven months down the road, it's a 10. Then you're really going to say it's a 20. Okay. Because it's masking it. Now, of course, pregnant women should not handle these because if you're pregnant with a male child, it can cause a lot of abnormalities. So pregnant women, that is an important thing to know because if you're a pregnant nurse, you don't want to be handling the pills, okay? And then another one that is becoming uh, more popular is uh, the Dutus dry ride, which is the Avodark, and that's actually a dual inhibitor and it blocks two isoenzymes to decrease the size. Proscar only blocks one. So uh, the DU, DU, sort of like dual, Castoride uh, blocks it two different ways. And you don't need to know the name of the isoenzymes or anything like that. Then you have your alpha adrenergic receptor blockers. And these don't decrease the secretion. They block the receptors. Um, so they relax the uh, prostate where the urine flow is easier, okay? These same medicines, if you look at them, you notice the ending of these, OSIN, these are also used a lot of times for hypertension. I think Flomax is one of the most common ones, but uh, Hytrin is also common for uh, prostate problems. Uh, and then Jalen is a newer drug, and it's a combination of both. So I look to see Jalen coming out more and more frequently. So just so you know. And then, of course, we have the drugs that if the uh, rectal dysfunction occurs, um, you may have to use it, and that's like the Cialis's. And so they might be on a combination of drugs for the growth, to decrease the growth, to uh, block the receptors, and they might need something for erectile dysfunction. So you might see them on all that stuff. Now, a lot of times patients will take the Sol uh, Palmato, 
And what that is, is an herb uh, preparation, but I have done research on that recently. And uh, research shows, and I think this is different than what your book says, research shows that it has no better effects than a placebo. Okay. Of course, you probably won't convince your patient of that, but that's what the research is showing. All right. A patient with BPH is on finasteride. The nurse expects what? Okay, mute me so you can think about it because I'm going to tell you the answer. And the answer is the PSA will drop by 50%. Okay, so now if the medications don't work, then we're going to do our minimally invasive therapies. Okay, and the minimally invasive therapies are basically we're not going to cut it out. Okay, so we'll do some microwave therapy where we heat it up and destroy the tissue that way. The problem with the microwave therapy is it's not specific to the prostate, so you can have uh, surrounding tissue problems, okay? And almost all of these a uh, common side effect is urinary retention and that you need a Foley. Um, and then you have the transurethral needle ablation, which is basically the exact same thing as the microwave except that it comes out of a needle so that you can be very exact and it doesn't destroy the surrounding tissue, okay? And most of these are outpatient, okay? Um, and then you also have your laser prostectomy, which is an alternative to the TERP, which is we're going to talk about that more extensively because that is the most common one. I see that maybe this laser prostectomy might actually start uh, gaining more use uh, because the symptoms improve almost immediately and in uh, tests, in research, it shows that it's pretty comparative to TERP uh, with the results. And this uses ultrasound or direct visualization, so you have to have ultrasound to guide the laser. Okay, to destroy the tissue basically is what it's doing. Uh, you do, this is an outpatient procedure and you do need to have a Foley. As I said, all of them you need to have a Foley. Okay, this one here, you might have some retrograde ejaculation. Remember, that's where the sperm goes up into the bladder. And it, it doesn't hurt anything. They just pee it out unless they're trying to get pregnant. And then that's a problem. But this one here has a more rapid recovery than the turf. So I'm looking for that one to become more uh, uh, common. Now, invasive surgery, this is the TERP, okay? Now, things we have to consider with this one is the age, surgical risk, do they have a lot of comorbidities? Do they have cardiac problems? The size and location of the prostate enlargement. Persistent residual urine. If they have persistent residual urine, this might be the one form. If they have frequent UTIs, this might be uh, something form. If they have acute urinary retention with no other reversible cause, this might be what they need. Um, decrease urine output causing distension discomfort. This one is what they might need. This is considered the gold standard, and it's transurethral resection of the prostate, or TURP, T-U-R-P. Fewer are being done because of the laser techniques, okay? So as I said, I think the laser techniques will become more popular versus this one. This one requires a hospital stay. The other ones that we've talked about are less invasive, and they don't necessarily need a hospital stay. And there is a nice little chart in your book that uh, tells you the big differences. Don't concentrate on little differences, but don't care about the little differences. This one here is uh, popular because uh, erectile dysfunction is unlikely, but erectile dysfunction is also unlikely in the laser. Um, basically, a scope, a resectoscope, because we're going to reset the prostate, is inserted into the urethra. There is no open area anywhere. You go straight through the urethra 
and you excise and cauterize the prostate at the same time. Now, this is the one post-operatively they are going to have a bladder irrigation, that three-way catheter. Remember CBI, continuous bladder irrigation. Now, depending on how drastic they had to cauter, uh, how drastic they had to excise the patient's history, if they were able to cauterize well or they had little bleeders, this might be intermittent or continuous. The most common that you see is continuous, okay? So the BCBI is the most common that you see. Now, post-op, the vast majority of patients do excellent. They may have retrograde ejaculation. Again, not a problem unless you're trying to get pregnant then that's a problem because your sperm count is going to be low or non-existent because it's all going to go back up into your bladder. Other than that, retrograde ejaculation is not going to hurt anybody. Uh, they just pee it out, so it doesn't hurt the person. After the uh, resection is done, you have to watch out for transurethral resection syndrome. And that is severe hyponatremia related to prolonged bladder irrigation, okay? So, and that, again, depends on how extensive the enlargement is and how long they have them under anesthesia and all that kind of stuff. So, hypernatremia is a real big thing that you have to watch for. And what I've listed here is basically the symptoms of hyponatremia, uh, nausea, vomiting, confusion, bradycardia, and hypertension. So revisit hyponatremia if you don't know the symptoms of that. Bleeding and clot retention is a problem, but that's why you have continuous irrigation. If patient is on anticoagulant, they have to stop them before, or maybe this isn't the surgery for them. Okay, if they are, if their cardiologist says no, they can't stop the anticoagulants, then maybe they need to revisit is the laser better form. Um, what they do is they do a transurethral incision, so they go up the penis into the urethra, and then they cut into the urethra into the prostate gland to relieve the pressure on the urethra. This is transurethral incision of the prostate. This is outpatient. It's also um, low erectile dysfunction or retrograde ejaculation. This is for small or moderately enlarged gland. This is not for a severely enlarged gland. But it does have the outcomes, same outcomes as the TERP. So that might be an alternative if you're looking to get pregnant. Because this one here, you have a low occurrence of retrograde ejaculation. So you're more likely to have less fertility problems with this one. So if you're a young person with small or moderate enlargement, this might be the one for him if the family still want to have kids. So that's the big difference between this one and TERP, okay? Now, health promotion. We uh, recommend, or, or the Urology Association recommends a PSA screening every two years for men age 55 to 69, or more often if needed. Um, Again, alcohol, caffeine, spicy foods uh, are irritants and it increases the symptoms because of the diuretic effect and it causes bladder distension. Avoid anticholinergic because again, remember we're giving alpha adrenergic drugs. Well, anticoagulants not only are irritative to the bladder, but they work against the prostate drugs we're given avoiding schedule. You don't want to restrict the fluids because you cause dehydration, but it's okay to restrict them in the evening, but you don't want to restrict them during the day uh, because they'll more likely get UTIs and bladder stones, okay? But it's okay to do it in the evening hours so that the nocturia is decreased. Preoperative care for a TERP, if they have a UTI, that needs to be resolved. Uh, if they don't have a UTI, they're still going to get prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, and this is going to be any uh, prostate surgery. If they have a UTI, it needs to be resolved before surgery. So they need to give them antibiotics till it's clear 
even if they have to, you know, do IV antibiotics or whatever they have to do to get that clear before they get started. Then they'll get the prophylactic antibiotics. Now, this is where we might use a CUDE. Remember I talked to you about CUDE? Um, it actually is a more rigid catheter with that curved tip, and it, it gets through those obstructions easier than a regular Foley. It's, it's more rigid. And they even have even more rigid ones that a urologist may place. Now, a CUDE, you as a nurse can place. Uh, or the uh, Urotex can place, but the more rigid ones past a coup day, that's when the urologist has to come in and place them. Um, again, you may have retrograde ejaculation after surgery, and we don't want to decrease or restrict fluids preoperatively because we don't want them in a dehydrated state. Possible complications of a TERP, hemorrhage, bladder spasms, urinary incontinence, and infection. I think those are all self-explanatory. Uh, Postoperatively, uh, most will have a continuous bladder irrigation with that three-way catheter. It is going to require continuous assessment. The irrigant is gonna be sterile normal saline and they come in huge bags. Um, and if you're like uh, pregnant and on a, a lifting weight restriction, you may not be allowed to lift those bags. That's how big these bags are. Uh, the rate of infusion uh, is determined by the color of the output and the presence of clot. So if you are monitoring a client and all of a sudden it gets bloodier, you have to increase the rate because you, if it starts getting more clots and stuff, then we need to wash them out so they don't clog up that catheter. When you need to stop the CBI is when the intake is more than the output. Because if you're putting this in, because you're going to do very meticulous, I know, you're going to calculate, you know, you're going to record these big bags, how much is going in, and you're going to be recording how much is coming out. And if those two don't actually pretty much equal each other, then you have a problem. Okay, so if your output is less than your intake, then you need to stop that CBI because there is a uh, problem and you need to call the doctor. Now, a normal finding is for blood clots to be expected 24 to 36 hours post-op. That is normal. Large amount of bright red blood can also indicate hemorrhage. So if you're getting, you know, six hours post-op and it's not clearing up any at all, you know, getting lighter and lighter, you might really consider calling your doctor, you know, and obviously be keeping an eye on those vital signs and stuff. This is a coup day. I mean, this is a three-way catheter. It's not a coup day because it doesn't have that tip that's uh, curved. But this is a three-way catheter. It has a place for the balloon. It has a place for intake and it has a place for output, okay? And you can also uh, manually irrigate these if you need to. And this is the setup for those who've never seen one before. You have a big bag of irrigation solution that's going into one part. Of course, you have the bulb. And then you, as you irrigate, it's floating around the bladder, and then it's coming back out to a drainage bag here. Again, this intake should equal this output. And this just shows a close-up of the inside of the catheter. It shows that it has a bulb inflation and the irrigate solution in it. Uh, a return. So that's just what that shows. Again, post-operative care, if you're going to manually irrigate, say they're not on continuous, they're on intermittent, and you think maybe there's clot or something, you need to manually irrigate, uh, you're going to irrigate with sterile normal saline 50 milliliters at a time. No, no more, because the more you do, the more likely you're going to get bladder spasms. So it's about 50 milliliters at a time. Um, hemorrhage may occur from displacement of a clot or displacement from the catheter. So it is possible that the catheter may actually need to have some traction put on it so that that bulb, that balloon, is sitting up against the neck of the bladder. 
So I've seen that before where they've had a bit traction on that catheter. Uh, as I said, dislodgement from a large clot may increase hemorrhaging. Increases in abdominal pressure, like straining to have bowel movements, can increase hemorrhage. Sitting or walking for long periods of time can increase hemorrhage. Of course, they're not going to be, be uh, doing a lot of walking with a three-way in, but they might be doing sitting. So laying in bed is the best option here. And we're going to be giving them stool softeners, okay, so that they're not straining to have a bowel movement. Because remember, they've been under general. And so their gut, you have to get it working again. And uh, they've been MPO before the surgery. So, you know, they might have some hard stools. So let's help them out. Bladder spasms. For bladder spasms, it's usually a cause by irritation of the bladder mucosa. Uh, say that you have a clot. Well, relieve any obstruction and that might help. Uh, if the patient forces urine around the catheter, forcibly pushes urine out, that can cause spasms, okay? So one of the things you want to tell them is not to force it out, because if they feel like there's an obstruction in the catheter, they're getting distended, and they're trying to force it out, we'll throw them into spasms. So some of the antispasmodics is ditropan. I'm sure you've heard of that, oxybutamine, peridium, the one that turns your urine orange, and opiate belladonna suppositories. Okay, this is one of the rare instances where we use opiate belladonna suppositories, and we still do use those to help with the muscles uh, or to help with the bladder spasms. Okay. The catheter usually stays in for two to four days and then it's removed and, and it will depend on the return as to when it's removed. If you're still getting a lot of clots and still getting a lot of blood back, you're not going to remove it. Okay. And before discharge, the patient has to void. Okay. After that catheter is removed. If he can't do it, he may have to have that catheter reinserted and go home with it. Um, and it's not unusual for them to have problems with their sphincter tone after having a catheter in any length of time. So it might take several weeks to return to normal, or it may never return to normal. But that would be the unusual. It usually returns to normal. And usually it's the dribbling and the incontinence after the Foley is DC that tells you the sphincter tone is problematic. So we teach them Kegel exercises. Okay, and men especially need to learn how to do a Kegel exercise when it comes to prostate. Us women, we sort of grew up knowing how to do Kegels because, you know, we were taught that at home. So be sure you explain how to do it and basically how it is, is for them to start their urine flow and then stop it voluntarily and start it and stop it. That will teach them which muscles to target when they do their Kegel exercises. So think about what you should be teaching them for discharge, okay? So here's what we should be teaching them. Catheter care, self-catheterization if needed or ordered, signs and symptoms of infection, taking the meds. Now, they are not to have any sex or to drive until the physician says it's okay. Um, and then once the physician says that it's okay. It might take uh, up to a year for normal sexual function to return to a man. Uh, how to manage urinary incontinence. They need to maintain hydration. They do not need to have fluid restrictions because they have urinary incontinence. That would just cause them to have a UTI. So you need to, to teach them to maintain hydration. And I'm talking two to three liters per day. Try avoiding schedule, again, for incontinence. Prevent constipation, because if they're straining, then that's going to be problematic with bladder spasms. Avoid heavy lifting, no more than 10 pounds until released by the physician. And then they should get at least yearly digital rectal exams, if not more frequently. But that's minimum, yearly. Okay, let's do another question. Do you determine the severity of symptoms for a patient in 
with benign prosthetic hyper, per, hyperplasia, the nurse will ask about and put me on pause because I'm going to tell you what I'm going, what you should ask about. And the answer is C, force of strength. Okay, a 61 year old male has an enlarged prostate detected on digital rectal exam and, and an elevated PSA. What will the nurse anticipate need to teach him about? Again, put me on pause because I'm gonna tell you the answer. And the answer is going to be transrectal ultrasonic. And remember, during that, they can do a uh, biopsy if they need to. So that's going to be the definitive one to decide, is this cancer or is this uh, BPH? Okay. Prostate cancer. Okay. If you have any questions about benign prosthetic hypertrophy, Please text them to me or email them to me. So we're going to go over prostate cancer. Most common cancer in men, excluding skin cancer, is the second leading cause of death in men. Lung cancer is number one. One in seven men will develop it. Now, we're doing better because that is a new statistic. Uh, I think when your books came out, it was one in five men. So we are doing better with that. So they are the, you know, the education is helping to get these PSAs done and these digital uh, rectal exams done. Prostate cancer is androgen dependent, meaning that it has to have testosterone to grow. Okay, that's what androgen dependent means. The risk factors are highest in African Americans and the older you get, and if there's a family history. There is some type of dietary link to red meat, high uh, fat dairy, and low vegetable intake, although I haven't found why, but they do have that. Early stage is usually asymptomatic and, and it is usually slow growing. Now they do have some that are aggressive, but that's rare. The slow growing ones are much more common. So if they're getting their yearlies, done, then they should be able to detect it. So early stage, they're not going to have any symptoms. But when they do start developing symptoms, it's going to be very similar to the benign prosthetic hyper, uh, hyperplasia. Now they may start having low back pain, and that usually accompanies uh, metastasis. Um, so the most common way the cancer travels is through the lymph nodes. And the most common places it goes is the bone, bladder, lungs, and liver. Bone is very common. So if we catch it late or if it's aggressive, it's going to mess. And one of the first places it's going to mess to is the bone. And that's why they're gonna have back pain. Uh, usually elevated PSA levels, remember that's the prostate a specific antigen. Uh, usually the diagnosis is made from just a screening, PSA, from a yearly screening. Uh, again, don't forget mild, mild elevations can also be caused from BPH. So if yearly there is an elevation of the PSA, then that needs to be investigated. Okay. The DRE, the digital rectal exam, again, that's going to be different than the BPH, uh, but it's still not definitive. Only a biopsy of the prostate is definitive. Now, having said that, uh, there is as high as 35% false negatives. So that's not good. So what is a new way of doing it, and this is not in your books, is an MRI ultrasound fusion biopsy. Again, it is a biopsy, but it is an MRI ultrasound guided biopsy, which is more accurate than the transrectal ultrasound. It's new and it's much more accurate. 
So I look to see that that probably will become the gold standard. But just so you know, uh, that's the new thing. Um, and then you can do bone scans, MRI, and CT for uh, METs uh, to try and find out where all it went if you suspect METs. The treatment will depend on the stage. 93% are diagnosed prior to it spreading. So that is awesome. Again, that tells that our education is working and uh, the men are getting their yearly exams. Now, staging is the TNM system, is the most commonly used staging. And that's usually used for pretty much all cancers. And that stands for tumor, node, and METs. So the tumor, is it encased? Um, how big is it? The node, lymph node, has it spread to the lymph node? Or metastasis, has it spread past the lymph nodes? So a lot of this rate, rating will depend on what you're going to do. So we might do the active surveillance again, which is again is the watchful waiting. And it just watching it is appropriate because remember it's slow growing. It's appropriate when the life expectancy is less than 10 years, if it's a low grade or low stage tumor, or if the client has serious comorbidities like cardiac or something like that, that putting them under anesthesia would be that would be worse than watching it. You know, they have to weigh which is better, which is worse, which is going to kill them first. So active surveillance is appropriate for those conditions. Now, if they decide on surgical treatments, a radical prostatectomy is usually the surgical treatment. And that's where the entire prostate gland is removed. And the seminal vesicles are removed the neck of the bladder is removed and they may remove lymph nodes if it's high risk of metastasis. Usually they have two different approaches, retropubic approach, which is basically the bikini line approach. Ladies, you'll know what the bikini line is for your C-section, same thing with men, low. Or per, uh, perineal approach and that's between the scrotum and anus. But that has a higher incident of infection because of just where it's at, okay? But they can do either one of these approach. And it is becoming more and more common to be robot assisted, like the Da Vinci, like uh, Gateway has the Da Vinci. So that is becoming more and more um, helpful to help prevent erectile dysfunction during these surgeries. Um, Post-op. Large Foley, <clears throat> uh, there's probably like a Jackson Pratt drain from the incision site. Obviously, you're going to have this incisional cleaning and dressing changes, especially if it's between the scrotum and anus. The hospital stay is anywhere from one to three days, depending on how well the client does. The complications are erectile dysfunction. It usually returns slowly, but it usually does return, but it can take up to two years, depending on the age. And urinary uh, incontinence. Most men will, will resolve this. It might take months, but most men can resolve this urinary incontinence. And some of the other complications, obviously those are the two big ones. That's why there's stars there. Other complications are just normal complications, the hemorrhage, the urinary retention, infection, wound T hissons, where if you remember from 101, that's where the wound separates, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary emboli, and that's basically from laying around. Now, the nerve sparing procedure is what is done nowadays, and that's if they can, uh, there is a nerve bundle outside the prostate and if they can spare it they will and the odds of erectile dysfunction is much less if they can spare this but if the cancer is already outside the prostate then they can't spare it and they'll probably have erectile dysfunction but if they can do nerve sparing procedure 
the risk is really reduced. Obviously, there's no guarantee, but it's really reduced. Um, another thing that might happen is chirotherapy or chiroablation. Cryo meaning freezing, ablation meaning removing or destroying. And it destroys cancer cells by freezing them. Um, it may be used first as the first line of defense, or it may be used after radiation fails. Okay. Liquid uh, nitrogen is used for that. So that might be something they can do if surgery is not uh, appropriate. You can have radiation. You can have external radi radiation or internal radiation. External radiation, five days a week for 48 weeks. Most frequently used radiation form is external. And cure rates are comparable to radical prostatectomy. But just from what you know, and I know you haven't had it, but just from what you know, five days a week, 48 weeks, radiation. Do you think maybe there might be some side effects? I'm thinking, yeah. So you have to weigh what's best for your particular patient. And then you have the internal radiation, which is called brachytherapy. And what happens is radioactive seeds are implanted. Uh, one of the uh, advantages is this a one-time outpatient procedure. So they go one time, okay? The seeds are permanent. They don't come out. Once they're in, they don't come out, okay? Now here is a picture of them on x-ray. Now, over time, these will lose its radioactiveness. It's actually very small radioactive. And over time, they will lose that. And these are planted right into the prostate gland. And that's what you're seeing on x-ray. You're seeing that's where the prostate gland is. And those are radioactive seeds uh, implanted right into them. Once they're in, they don't come out. Okay. All right, the nurse will teach a patient who is incontinent of urine following a radical retro pubic prostatectomy to, okay, um, put me on mute or put me on pause so that I'm going to tell you what it is. Of course, we're going to do pelvic muscle exercises. In other words, Kegel. Okay, drug therapy. Okay, this is using advanced or metastatic disease. And androgen deprivation therapy, or ADT, decreases the circulating androgens. Remember, cancer, uh, prostate cancer is dependent on testosterone. So we can give drugs that will decrease the circulating testosterone. Um, unfortunately, after a while, the tumor becomes resistant. Uh, and the first sign that is becoming resistant to this therapy or this medicine is your PSA will start increasing again. So just FYI. But basically what happens in these inhibitors is the acts on the pituitary, so it is unresponsive to LH, uh, remember, you have your luteinizing hormone. Those are the luteinizing hormones. Um, and those are the ones who, who help us with the gonads uh, hormones. So what happens is it the luteinizing uh, hormone, releasing hormone, comes from the hypothalamus. So it still releases it. But the inhibitors act on the pituitary so that the pituitary doesn't care. It, it, it is unresponsive to the releasing hormone. So it won't release the hormones, the luteinizing hormone. Um, and then another way is we, we also uh, block the receptors. So yeah, you have the testosterone, but we block the receptors on the cells from being able to connect. So Androgen deprivation therapy works multiple different ways. One is it inhibits the testosterone production. And two, it prevents the testosterone from connecting with the receptors. And then there's a third way, and that is an orchiectomy, which is a testicle 
removal because where does the testosterone come from? It comes from the testes. So if we have to, then remove the testes and that way we have no testosterone. Okay. So another thing is they could have chemotherapy or they could have a combination of all these. Okay. Obviously, for health promotion, we want to encourage the patients to have their PSAs and digital rectal exams. Those of higher risk, like family history and stuff, they should begin their testing early, age 45. They may need it yearly versus every two years. We're going to do a lot of pre and post op care, palliative care, end of life care. Care for metastatic disease focuses on pain control symptom alleviation, and emotional support and safety. So that is your goals if it's met. Now, palliative care is not the same as end-of-life care. Palliative care is more control of the symptoms. Okay, end-of-life care is usually they're on death's doorway. So palliative care can actually last years or months. Uh, end-of-life care, that's when, you know, they're, again, one foot in the grave. Okay, now we're done with prostate cancer. We're going to go into inflammation of the prostate, which is called prostatitis. This is one of the most common problems in the prostate. It's a group of inflammatory and non-inflammatory conditions. And the most common type is not bacterial. You might have infectious agents, and what they can do is descend from the bladder into the prostate like if you have a bladder infection, or can ascend to the prostate via urethra. So it can do it either way. It can either go down or up towards the prostate. The symptoms are perineal pain, and then again, a lot of regular urinary infections. The big symptom that's different is post-ejaculation pain. Okay? Um, so that's what would key you into pro, uh, prostatitis. They're going to have fever chills because again, it's an inflammatory process, low back pain, and you can get uh, uh, actually acute bacterial uh, prostatitis. And that's usually when you get the low back pain in an acute condition. But again, most of them are not caused by uh, bacteria. Complications. Enlarged prostate, of course, because it's inflamed, and then all those urinary retention symptoms, okay? Diagnosis is a history and P, uh, history and physical. And then one of the big ways to do it is a urinalysis before and out after vigorous prostate massage. And what they do is uh, they'll have the uh, client boy, and then the doctor will do a rectal prostate massage and then they'll have them void again. And we are looking for uh, uh, prostate things, <laughs> you know. Um, if you have the inflammation, then the prostate's going to be uh, congested. So that the massage helps uh, if you do the massage, then it's going to bring out uh, those chemicals. The treatment is broad spectrum oral antibiotics for up to four weeks of acute infection. So this is not a seven to 10 day thing. This is up to a month. If they're febrile with potential for sepsis, because remember a lot of people with prostate problems are older people. They may need IV antibiotics. They might need um, hospitalization. If they have a chronic prostatitis, okay, where they just can't get rid of it in four weeks, they may need antibiotics for up to eight to 12 weeks, which is like three months. Um, and if they're immunosuppressed, they might need antibiotics for their life. So if they have HIV or something like that, they might have to have antibiotics always. And of course, you know, if you take antibiotics for long periods of time, your body gets resistant. Analgesics. Uh, alpha adrenergic blockers, and we already talked about them, and anti-inflammatory agents. A warm cyst bath, 
may be ordered. Uh, fluid intake, we still want to increase fluid intake. And the actual, the uh, client may be instructed to have repetitive prostate massage uh, to relieve prostate congestion and pain. And basically how they do that on the, their own is have sex or, or increase their masturbation. Uh, it'd be sort of hard for them to do a rectal massage on themselves. Okay, what is active surveillance appropriate? When is active surveillance appropriate for prostate cancer? Okay, uh, pause me because I'm going to tell you the answer. And the answer is patient's life expectancy is less than 10 years. Okay, now we're going to talk about other problems with penis, and we are just going to uh, go through these pretty quickly. Um, Hypospadia is when the urethra opening is on the ventral or the back side of the penis. It's not at the end of the penis. This is usually congenital and it's usually fixed pretty young. Um, and it does need to be fixed or you're going to have a lot of infections and stuff. But this shows you where it could be. You don't need to know all these names, but just know hypospadia is uh, an opening on the ventral side instead of the, the uh, glands penis at the tip of the glands penis. Then you have phimosis, which is a tightness of the foreskin around the penis, making it difficult to retract it. Okay, so this is obviously for people who are not, um, oh, what am I trying to say? You know what I'm trying to say, who haven't had the foreskin removed. Um, it's usually caused by inflammation from poor hygiene. So it's in a down position and they can't get it back up to clean around it. Um, again, it's usually caused from poor hygiene. Topical steroids for a few days may work or they might have to have surgery. And the surgery might be to remove the foreskin or maybe just to cut up the dorsal end of it, depending on the situation, okay? Now, paraphimosis is an emergency. This is when that the foreskin is actually in the retracted position and you can't pull it down. This will compromise arterial flow to the glands. And you, this is emergency. They need to get that down or they can get in green and all that stuff. So we got to get that correctly down. So they'll probably give them pain medicine and they'll probably have a manual reduction. In other words, you're going to pull it down. Uh, antibiotics, warm soaks. Again, you might have to have emergency surgery. You might have to have that dorsal uh, cut, or you might have to have the whole foreskin removed. That one is a medical emergency. Uh, and priapism, which is an erection that lasts for longer than six hours. This again is an emergency. And again, the treatment depends on the cause. Um, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, Sometimes they'll have to stick a needle into the penis to draw the blood out. Uh, but this is, you can't ignore this. This is a priority patient. Uh, penile cancer, it's rare in the US. Risk is increased if they have a history of the human papilloma virus. It's usually a non-tender. It starts out with like a pimple-like or wart-like appearance and it may be mistaken for genital warts. In the early stages, uh, a laser removal will take care of it. So ladies, if you see this on your men folk, be sure that they're getting that taken care of. And men, when you inspect your monthly inspection, make sure you're looking for that. Problems with the scrotum and testes. Epididymitis, and that's the inflammation of the epididymis. It's painful and all, all sexual partners must be treated with antibiotics. If only one sexual partner is treated, then they can keep passing it back and forth. So epididymitis, it can be uh, a spread through the ejaculate. Uh, orchitis is an inflammation of the testes. Uh, again, it's painful. And the treatment is exactly the same as epididymitis because it's usually from a uh, bug. And again, that can also be spread to sexual partners. 
cryptochartism is understanding testes, and I'm sure you're going to get more of this in uh, PEs, but it's a, the most common uh, congenital testicular problem. It usually affects the right side, and they usually have surgery by age two. If not, they have a high risk of infertility if they don't get that down. And this here shows the hydrocell. Uh, it is a non-tender fluid-filled mass in the scrotum. Uh, the usually cause is uh, lymph drainage. It really isn't needed to uh, have surgery or anything on it unless it becomes very large or discomfort. It can cause infertility. So this little, little kid here can cause infertility. Uh, I'm sorry, the surgery can cause infertility. So that's why it's not necessarily treated um, unless it becomes very large. Um, and there's great video on YouTube showing a uh, surgical removal of the hydrocell. So just go to YouTube and, and type that in, you'll see one. Um, spermatocell is a firm sperm containing cysts of the epidemic Didymus causes a known. A varicocele is a dilation of veins that drain the testes. A testicular torsion is a twisting of the spermatic cord. And if you'll remember the picture at the very beginning of this slide, uh, you'll be able to see it. This is a medical emergency, testicular torsion. Any type of torsion is basically an emergency because it cuts off the blood supply. Okay, so surgery is needed. Testicular cancer, it has become much less common because of Lance Armstrong. Those of you who know who Lance Armstrong is, you know that he was the bicyclist who had testicular cancer and made it public. Um, so it has become more in the people's eye because of it, even though it's rare. It's most common in young men, 15 to 44. It's a painless lump. It can either have a slow onset or it can have a rapid onset. So this is why we encourage men to do their uh, uh, scrotal exams, their testicular exams. And then erectile dysfunction. Uh, more than 10 million people are affected and 40% of the men affected are 40. So that's pretty young you know, be affected by erectile dysfunction. Up to 70% of men are affected at age 70. There is an increasing incidence. Some of the causes are recreational drugs and alcohol, and that's usually in the younger men. Diabetes, well, you know diabetes is on the rise, so that means renal disease is on the rise, which means hypertension is on the rise. Some medications uh, can give you a side effect. And then if you have post-prostate surgery, that can cause it. Decreased hormone secretion like testosterone, that can cause it, or stress, that can cause it. The treatment is with erectogenic drugs. That would be your Viagra and uh, those type of drugs. Uh, it, you cannot take these type of drugs if you're on nitrates. Uh, like nitrogen, uh, nitroglycerin. So if somebody is got chest pain or angina or a history of MI and they take nitroglycerin, they cannot take erectile dysfunction drugs. It will really potentiate the hypotensive effects of the nitrates and I mean, it can cause death. So they can't do it. Side effects, flushing, headache, uh, rare but sudden hearing loss. Uh, priapism, remember, that is the erectile dysfunction, uh, the erection lasting six hours or more. Remember, that's a medical emergency. And they can get visual disturbances. And besides the drugs, there are actually vacuum reject, uh, ejection, that shouldn't say erection, yeah, it should be. Vacuum erection devices, basically a vacuum. Uh, injections, which I don't think most men would want to really inject their penis, and penile implants. But the most common you see are the Cialis and the Viagra. 
Okay, now remember, I know this is a lot of information, but remember, concentrate on the prostate, uh, the BPH, and you might want to know um, like the emergency situation on the other stuff. But remember, most of the exam is going to be renal and benign prostatic hypertrophy. I hope this was helpful. If you have questions, let me know.